Hey everybody, welcome to Whiskey, Lead, and Steel, Feelings Hurt While You Wait, the official podcast of Aggressive Defensive Solutions. Joining us on the panel today, of course, the future governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Lee Curling. Commanding forces, uh, uh, <laughs> command, commanding officer, uh, Redneck Forces Atlantic, uh, Commodore Jeremy Phillips. You're coming uh, now, right? Sure. Is that what it is? Okay. And, uh, it's a title, not a rank. That's right. <laughs> it's an honorific. <laughs> and I'm just Rick. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, it's been a while. If you're seeing this, uh, thank you for staying with us because we, we took some time off because life. Um, but here we go. So we were kicking around today, kicking around ideas, and um, we're talking about the concept of the, the intertwining concepts of how important is it that you trust your your equipment, your gear, whatever it is. How do you go about testing and verifying that your equipment is reliable? And then, last but not least, how does it apply to knowing what your mission is because that's you know do you do you really need an m1 abrams to drive down to the store and pick up a box famo yes if you live in kiev probably <laughs> um chicago or chicago <laughs> san francisco yeah. yeah. Smash and grab. <laughs> smash and grab. Yeah. You probably won't get a smash and grab if you're an M1. That's right. Well, if, you, if you're driving an M1 through San Francisco, you're like old fucking Patton. We're going to grease our treads with our guts. <laughs> if Patton could have swam, I'd have let him be in the Marine Corps. I, that dude was fucking hardcore. <laughs> All right. So, um, since it was your idea, Jeremy, why don't you get this ball rolling? So, the, the, where, where this idea came from um you know as as we have brought numbers of guns into the shop some brand new never fired and you know skillfully messed up and others that have you know seen some use and need some love mm-hmm. you know and a predominant amount well i don't want to say a predominant amount a significant amount of them were 1911 based platforms of various manufacturers shapes and sizes you mean the most perfect firearm ever created? Well, so that, V plus Ultra, so the, that, the winner of two world wars. Yeah. Right. So that got me into you know doing some reading as I am apt to do, and usually the most you know when people complain, oh, it's not reliable, it's not reliable, it's not reliable out of the box. Usually the first rebuttal of that was, well, you got to go put X number of rounds through it before it's reliable. It's like, you know, I. I I don't remember checking my M9 out from the armory or checking out a Glock 19 and, you know, being told, hey, go put 500 rounds through it and then you can carry it. So, you know, that, that kind of spurred the thought of, okay, you know, at what point is it reliable? I mean, sure, every gun that I've bought that I've carried, I've gone out and put mm-hmm. a couple of boxes through or whatnot <laughs> before I stuffed it into a holster and into my waistband and away I went. But, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on that? You know, do you... Buy it fresh from the gun store, throw a, you know, pack a PMC ball in it and, you know, stuff it in your waistband and away you go. Or do you use it at the range for five years and put 25,000 rounds for it before you, you know, trust it? Yeah. So, um, before we get into the whole <laughs> 1911 <laughs> rabbit hole diatribe, um, to answer the question about whether or not, you know, how, how I go about determining, you know, what I'm going to do before I carry a gun. Uh, if given the choice, and I usually am, I don't, I don't shoot a gun that I haven't taken out and shot to the point that it was disgusting, right? Um, now, it doesn't take long to do that. I mean, re- realistically, if you know what you're doing, if you have a plan, that's part of the thing. Um, you should be able to put 150 rounds through a gun in an hour. So you mean I don't need to sign up for a 48-hour weekend class and put 960 rounds through it on Saturday to trust it? Only if you want the sandwich package. Then you get the (laughs) upgraded sandwich. The point is, you're not, I'm not carrying a gun until I've done this. Mm -hmm. Because it needs to be broken in. No, it's, You're it's doing just it. when you it's trust. A, it. That's right. It's that's how and and the whole idea there is. So, 
Because the thing you got to remember is, and this is one of the things that people who don't shoot guns a lot, don't work with a lot of different guns, don't understand what has happened to the market, which is actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. So there are loads of ammo that are designed in whatever caliber you want to be shot through as practice ammo and as duty or service ammo, defensive ammo, that are designed specifically for the application that you're looking, right? Uh, there are there are manufacturers of ammunition who make 45 ACP semi-jacketed hollow points that are designed to run through a three-inch compact gun. Mm -hmm. If you put that ammo in a five-inch barrel, which is typically what you get out of a 45 ACP, um, it's going to act very differently than it does if you stick it in um, your your compact Glock. Conversely, if you take nine millimeter, 127 grain plus P plus nine millimeter SXT, which is designed to run realistically out of a four and a half inch barrel, four and a quarter inch barrel, and you stick it in a Sig three, uh, a Sig uh, 365, not even the X. Two inch, two and a quarter. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> not the bullet's not going to perform. So your internal, external, and terminal ballistics are all going to be different. So before I carry a gun for defensive purposes or or to go shoot deer with it, whatever it is I'm going to do with it, before I employ that firearm to do that firearm's job, I take the the ammo that I'm likely to utilize, and I take that gun out, and I make sure that the gun shoots that ammunition effectively and accurately because those tie into play and then i take the opportunity while i'm there to shoot the gun and if there are tolerance stacking issues if there are if there are poorly manufactured parts whatever they're likely to show up in that first 150 rounds and then if well, i've gotten through 150 rounds and the, the gun hasn't jammed hasn't broke whatever i take it home i clean it i inspect it when i clean it make sure everything's good you are at that stage of the game, in my opinion, you are on the far side of verifying that this gun works. Could your gun break on round 151? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not going to say statistically because I haven't checked it off on a box. I'm not an engineer by trade. But in my experience, anecdotally, that's usually how that works. Tying in with that, we all know this. Um, uh, well, it, the AR-15 platform is so finicky and so that you, you must keep it absolutely perfectly lubed and you can't shoot more than eight or nine magazines of pristine ammo without fully cleaning the gun because they're not reliable, they won't work. Well? That gun I brought out yesterday would prove otherwise. <laughs> yeah, well, so, one of the, so when we run the four-day carbine class, which is 2,500 rounds of carbine, Mm -hmm. And four about four hundred rounds of handgun in a four day class. A lot of a lot of fucking uh, copper on paper and lead on steel. Um, what we tell people all the time for that class is bring two hundred rounds of good quality ammunition that you're going to qual with and that you're going to dope your gun with, and then other than that, buy the shittiest, cheapest, dog shit Russian or Turkish ammo that you can, and then we're not going to clean the gun. We might wipe the bolt down some, but I want you to run your gun filthy until it fails. They very mm -hmm. rarely fail. Typically when they fail, it's a combination of the gun is dirty and dry, but realistically at the end of the day, you weren't holding the gun hard enough. No. You didn't put enough ass. So the whole idea there is to prove to people, yeah, you can, my, my training carbine when I was teaching at Blackwater, I would get two or three classes before I would clean that carbine. <laughs> and I would do a demo over a, over a five-day class. I would probably demo, I don't know, 2,500 rounds if I got the chance. Shoot the piss out of it in demos because I didn't have to buy the ammo. <laughs> so we're getting, you know, close to 10,000 rounds between cleanings. Yeah. So that proves that it works. It also gives you the opportunity to go, okay, now I know how, you know, now I know that I can operate this gun this kind of dirty. 
What What are your thoughts on that, Lee? As you go, because you you've done the same kind of thing. Yeah, that, you know, covering everything in LSA. That, <laughs> generally, the the cover covering it in oil is is a is a failure of of something else. Yeah. Right. Something yep. else. The look. I I was I was always a believer. In, you know, when I was in the army, of look, I, I want to run the gun dry. Yeah. Right. I don't, I don't want to. Especially dust oil. You 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 coat it in 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 greasy mungy oil. All you're gonna all you're doing is you're you're gonna end up creating a carbonized mud. mud. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Where, whereas I'm yeah. from the other environment where everything's corrosive, so yeah, everything's corrosive. Gets a little bit so, so <laughs> we, yeah, so, so like in, in Iraq, we used a, um, a graphite lubricant, right? Mm -hmm. So, so we, we lubricated, but we, we used a graphite, and, and, and yeah, you're cleaning your gun every day you're, for very different reasons. Yes. I didn't fire it, but you're cleaning it, right? Desert Storm, I clean my M60 every day why because i wanted it to work yes <laughs> right but but realistically right I, I'm, I'm i'm with you on the you know when i got my i picked up the shield you know mm -hmm. came out did the same thing fired about 150 rounds and those were 150 rounds of the you know crap you know it was good quality ammo just crappy stored yeah right um tumble to get the corrosion and, and, and gunk off. Most of it. Right? Most of it. Right? I got the the, the 365. Same thing. Yeah. Right? No problem feeding that ammo that quite realistically, right, those 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 casings were there's it's a little bit of extra here and there and you know what? Fed it no problem. Yeah. Now so the, the whole idea of hey, you need to go fire a bunch of rounds to break it in. Yeah. Now, with Amy's um, uh, Legion X5 Legion, it it did not want to feed that ammo. But again, that gun's a, a little bit tighter. It's, it's a race gun. It's a race gun, right? There's 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 some differences there. So it does go back to the what's the tool you're using and what are you using the tool for? Yeah. What is that tool's mission, right? And that's, right, if it's defensive carry and you you got a gun that's a defensive carry gun, it's, yeah, get 150 rounds or so through it and is it functioning the way you expect it to function? And does it function that way with the ammo you're going to carry it with? Well, and to right? that point and mm -hmm. to your point as well, you know, Hey, how often do you check it? Mm -hmm. You know, how you know? Do you shoot it throughout the year after it's accumulated a whole bunch of pocket lint in your red dot optic? Do you you know check it with the duty ammo? Not saying that that duty ammo expires once a year, as we've talked about before, but you know how how often do you check what you're carrying? Because I have had you know told you your favorite caliber three eighty mm -hmm. Glock forty two single stack that I carried. For a summer, and one day, buddy of mine wanted to compare it to his Glock 43. So I was like, "Hey, it's sitting over there on the holster on the you know stand by the door. Go ahead, clear it, and take a look at it." And he's like, "I can't get the slide to come back. Yeah, you know, I can't get the slide." Well, to just come spray back. a little MAN on it, you pussy. And finally, and <laughs> he did, and finally he handed it to me. He's like, "Here you go." And I was like, "Oh, you're right. It is locked in battery." But, it would, to, but it would fire one round. One round. <laughs> I've, I've had that. You only need one. I've, I've had that happen a couple of times in my <laughs> life. Right? But before we go down those rabbit holes, <laughs> um, you know, finally what I ended up doing is I put it against the counter, for it, mm -hmm. racked it off the rear slide. But come to find out that Glock, after Gen three, and they went to environmentally friendly coatings on it, mm -hmm. um, the two rear uh, tabs on the frame rusted into the slide. You're right. That would have been mm -hmm. a really short fucking defensive gun use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I had it been, but and mm -hmm. lesson learned on that. Glocks, there's not enough meat or steel on a Glock, whatever that fuck was, 380. Yeah. To really effectively bludgeon anything bigger than a topper. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> switch from oil to grease. Never had a problem with that slide locking up mm -hmm. again. But to the point of 
hey, in the environment of carrying it, in the holster mm-hmm. you're going to carry it, with the ammo and how you're going to use it, hey, how do you, ch- you know, how often do you check it so that at round 151, mm-hmm. it doesn't freaking, you know, blow to pieces on you? So, well, so, since you mentioned that, so I carried, carried a gun concealed, still do, but started carrying a gun concealed, and then started carrying a gun on duty in a concealed manner um, back in 1999, 14 years I was in the Bureau. Um, I'm in the habit now of once a week just blowing the dust gunnies out of the gun. <laughs> Drop the mag, lock the slide to the rear, hit it with compressed air, or literally just pull it apart and just blow all that shit out of there because it, it collects that stuff in there. And because of that, and because we live in Tidewater, which is slightly more humid than the bottom of the ocean. Um, slightly less. Yeah. But yeah. No, 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 slightly more. Slightly more. <laughs> I've been scuba diving and I've lived in Chesapeake. And I think life's easier with a, with a fucking uh, dragger on your back. Um, so, so, that's it. So, what I, what I do is because of humidity and sweat and because of all of the dust monies that cl- collect there, I carry all of my concealed guns absolutely dry. I say absolutely dry. I probably put, in a striker-fired gun, I probably put a drop in the striker channel, and I probably put a drop where the sear and the striker come in contact. Other than that, everything's dry. Um, Because if you put any lube in there and you start adding dust bunnies, and then mm-hmm. you get any humidity because I've I've pulled my gun off and seen it coated in water mm-hmm. from where condensation collected on getting in and out of cars. Um, you'll just turn that shit to mud mm-hmm. if the gun's dry. And I've seen this happen. You get this cool flash where all the lint burns, <laughs> and it's frightening the first time it happens because. Your hand is engulfed in a big wad of flame, but it's not hot enough to do anything. Yeah. And then the gun runs fine. But if you've got mud in there, you know, because... It gets sluggish. Of, yeah. 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 So, and I, you know, I, I run into these old guys. Oh, you Jimmy Bob, you know, oh, you got to put oil on there. I'm like, no. No, no not yeah. if you're carrying it concealed. So, yeah. So, yeah I'll, it, I'll put a dab come, of grease on the, on the rails just mm-hmm. because I'm a sweaty motherfucker and my sweat, I've proven that it fucking corrodes guns. Mm-hmm. Heck, you just took sights off one of mine that, you know... Yes, I did. <laughs> if you polish everything, that helps. Yes, true. Not only does it make the gun run faster, but one of the things I tell people is when you polish the metal like that, you cut all the pores out. That's why it's shiny. Mm-hmm. And then there's less place for salt, any corrosive material to grab a hold of. Or when you start shooting the gun it's harder for the carbon to actually attach itself. So it makes it easier to clean the gun mm-hmm. and also causes the gun to run faster. So, yeah. But yeah, the, the idea of, well, you got to break this gun in. Unless you're talking about a precision rifle or a really, really, really expensive, probably made in Italy shotgun that you're going to shoot <laughs> clays with or live birds. Mm-hmm. I don't know that seasoning a barrel, seizing an action is the thing that you need to do. I, I think you hit on some, a, a good way to say that. Seasoning. Because you're right. If it's a precision rifle, right? If it, That's if a break-in it's, procedure. If, if, so. it's, if it's something that that level of accuracy, mm-hmm. right? There is part of, you know, trying to get those pieces of the manufacturing process out of the barrel. Yeah. Right? That, that makes sense. But that's not a go fire 500 rounds, so it runs reliably. Yeah. That's that's a whole different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and then you know the other, the other aspect of it, guns are mechanical things. Mm-hmm. Like mechanical things, eventually they will all get to failure. Yep. And that I guess kind of irks me with these you know torture tests you see. Oh, I I, I won't trust it because so and so broke it after 80,000 rounds. Yeah. Okay, guns break. They're mm-hmm. going to. Whether it's after right. five thousand rounds, fifty thousand, five hundred thousand, they're going to break. Yeah, I, I, I ran this I, I ran this race car 
you know, and, and let eighty thousand. Yeah, I, I, commu I commuted 000. in my Ferrari F one yeah. around DC, and I didn't change years. the mile, and I ran it on unleaded gas. Yeah, yeah what did you expect it's... was going to happen? Well, to, so to that end, when I was working for Mike, mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the women from W three came in, Heather, and uh, she was very dissatisfied. She said, "Wow, this is the third time I've had to have this gun worked on in in a year and a half." Well, what's the deal here? She had a 365X mm -hmm. as a competition gun. Mm -hmm. And I went, what are you talking about? She goes, well, this is, this is what I shoot. The IPSC and IDPA and Women with Weapons and Second Saturday Series with. Mm -hmm. And I said, you, you realize okay. that that gun is designed from an engineering standpoint to have a shelf life, realistically, a service life of right around 7,000 rounds. Because it's it's not a service grade weapon. It's not big enough. It's not heavy enough. It's not what it's designed. For. It's designed for you to once a year shoot it once or a twice year. a year to make sure yeah. you know how to. Work. But other than that, it's there for things have gone to shit right here, right now in the Harris Teeter parking lot. Of course, it's failing. Yeah. What? And I go yeah. no. Yeah. If you want to shoot a com competition gun, you need to build it off, and you want to stay with Sig. You need to build it off of a three twenty. Or, you know, or, or two, uh, 228, something like that. And she was, but she was all a gas. And I was like, hey, you, you got to understand what it is that you're looking to do. Which segues nicely to the 1911s. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to take this out and shoot 19,000 rounds for it to, to get it broke in. You'll know this. You'll probably know this because you were in the Navy. So the with the exception of, I think, 100 or so guns that the Department of the Navy bought for the Marine Corps Raider program back when they were still marked at one. The United States military hasn't purchased a 1911 firearm since 1943. Yep. They were all rebuilds and shit that never got around to being used. And if you pick up a gun, a 1911, as designed by John Moses Browning, who was a genius, and you shake it, unless it's full of grease, it goes... And it's built in with tolerances for grit and dirt and carbon and lubrication and the fouling thereof and the, the X factor that you can't count on so that after swimming ashore from the Mike boat at Normandy or Guadalcanal and fighting continuously for the next 60 days as you moved inland without the opportunity to pull that fucker apart and clean it and then... You forgot, and you left it in your rucksack after V-Day, and then you took it out to go shoot it with your kid in 1968. It still worked. It's designed to do that. Now, it was also designed for you to be able to hit a man in the chest at 50 yards consistently. And that's how accurate it needed to be. And then, well, and then everybody started building race guns out of them. And they mm -hmm. started stacking the tolerances. And then if you find anybody who is a fanboy of AKs, of the Dragunov systems, and hates M4 systems, they'll tell you, well, the M4 is a problem because the tolerance is too dragging. That's why the AK is great, because 17 villagers can shit in it and it still shoots. Um so what happens is when you start stacking all these tolerances on these 1911s, well, then they don't run as well, especially when they get dirty and they, right? Well, what you've done is you said, we're going to create a competition gun uh -huh. and the consumer goes, it should run like this, this military gun. I bought a Jeep, but I want a Ferrari. Right. And ex but expect it to still be able to run like a Jeep. Uh huh. Yeah, I want to be able. I should be yeah. able to go off road in my F one Ferrari. Mm -hmm. That that's the concept. Mm -hmm. Well, that ain't gonna fucking work. Right. And and so then you get the guys who go, well, what you got to do? You got to take it out and break it in. Well, right. breaking it in is part of the process of cleaning up, getting all the machining done, and, and getting all of your tolerances broken in. Well, your defensive gun, we get back to what is the mission, your defensive gun should not be that type. No. Period. Because when you get dust bunnies in it. 
so on. So. But yeah, you know, to the point of it being mechanical, you know, is my number before I trust something zero? No. Is it twenty five thousand? Also no, because at that point it probably had all of its springs replaced as well. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 somewhere towards the more beginning rather mm-hmm. than the latter of those because you know again like you said everything has a service life whether it's a three sixty five designed for seven thousand rounds or a three twenty designed for twenty five thousand mm-hmm. rounds eventually everything fucking breaks. Yes, everything will fail. I want to carry it you know to your point of running mm-hmm. shoes in a marathon. I don't want to change our running shoes in a marathon. No, you know right. I, I want to carry it while it's still in the middle of that service life, mm-hmm. not towards the beginning of the bell curve, and certainly not towards the end. Right. So. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And yes, I would like to, you know, carry it in, you know, how I, how it's going to be used operationally. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's another thing, and we've talked about this with <laughs> training concepts. So if you go, well, I'm going to, I'm going to carry my whatever, and I'm going to carry this from a concealed, this is going to be my concealed carry gun. So I'm going to sign up for the two-day John Wick extravaganza, and I'm going to do all of my training at that in my drop leg rig with my mags in a pouch across my chest a la Rhodesian and, you know, gloves hanging off of me and all this other cool shit. To be a better, to be a better... To be a better... So I, I can... Concealed carry? Yeah, so I can be a better concealed carry shooter. Yeah. And I'm yeah. And I'm not gonna not gonna wear a jacket over my, my gun or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think the next carbine course I am gonna take a Kalashnikov. The, 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 the next one I go to review, that's that's what's coming, I think. I I, I can that or a mini fourteen. You know what? <laughs> you should bring him <laughs> have, having look having <laughs> shot both of them a lot. Actually, I will point out I own a Mini fourteen. <laughs> I don't own an AK forty seven anymore. <laughs> I haven't owned an AK. I haven't owned an AK forty seven. I don't think this century. We're old enough that we can make when, statements like that. When, you know, when, when, the, when the North Korean paratroopers, you know, drop out of the sky, I'll get an AK-47 then. That's right. <laughs> there'll, like, there's, there's, there'll, there'll be, be plenty, plenty of them laying around. There'll be plenty of them laying around. Yeah, like Sergeant Major Plumley said, if I need one of them, I'll have access to it. That's right. We don't have to worry about that, because I saw the movie, and the, the the Koreans are jumping into Seattle. That's, that's right. <laughs> Which... <laughs> I don't know if they can bother to jump in. They could just, you know, show Walk. up. <laughs> Get a the train. Train. They, 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 they probably they, they could fly into the airport and, and they'll, be, they'll be welcomed. Right? That's right. Hey, here's your here's your phone. Here's your visa. Here's your voter card. Here's your, here's your. Hey, we've been, we've been waiting for the communists to show up. That's right. Please save us. We're so happy. Please save us from capitalism. That's right. Oh, hang on, I got it. First thing you get, get, get a selfie. Let me get a selfie with some comedy. First thing you get to do is go to a re-education camp. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, so you, yeah. So you learn what real communism is. Not your brand of communism. No, no, no. Your, your brand of communism. No. You're going to no. learn about our brand of communism. Our, our brand of communism is you're going to starve. That's right. Oh. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no. You got to work. This is a farm. Yeah, look. We're, we're not very technologically savvy, so... You got to work the farm, <laughs> or short, or they go. I don't like this a communism. Or they take a really hard left communism, and they go, "Oh, you wear glasses. You look smart. No, go stand in that line over there. Oh, yeah, <laughs> oh you can. Hey, what does this say? Oh, you can read. Yeah, let's go go stand over there by the Pol Pot Memorial mm-hmm. parking lot. Oh, this took a left turn. This <laughs> is this is. <laughs> Figured in the end, literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am going to go see the Brady movie tonight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. All right. So, so any <laughs> rocks, bottles, bombs, or hand grenades? Uh, let's see. Bursas still suck. Communism sucks worse than bursas. Go. Oh, well, this is this is true. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Communism sucks a lot. It does. Uh, and if you need your Tang Folio milled for an optic. Hey. 
They look. Nobody gave us money to say that Arsenal Performance and Gunworks can make whatever gun you've got, if they're willing to work on it, a better gun. Um, if you if you own a Ruger SR22, a Smith and Wesson M&P 22 Magnum or 5.7, um, or a Bursa, don't bother talking to them. Oh, or an AK. Don't bother talking to them about AKs. I was going to say, you know, they won't you do bring, shit you for AKs. You can bring your Draco, and you can bring your High Point, though. Yeah, and you, and you guys tried to find somebody to uh, work on an AK, and they're like, yeah, 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 no, yeah. Yeah. Nope, nope. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we called around because we're like, we don't want to fuck with that. It's too much. And we called around to all the guys, and they're like, mm. no. No. no, no, no working on that. So, but to be fair, and I had to explain this to Sam. But, but would you share credit? No. And here's why. You can't. Because you have to take it apart. You have to take it apart to properly... Everything's fucking to, pinned together. To properly mm -hmm. Cerakote, you, it, you have to take everything apart. Mm -hmm. Unless you had a huge bath, if we, which we don't. But if you had a bathtub as big as a water trough, and you filled it with brake clean, and put your AK-47 in there, and then it was still viable when you took it out, because it's all fucking pig metal, um, then we could Cerakote it. Made by those trained But all the parts won't necessarily work correctly then. And since I refuse to do shitty work, you can't work on an AK. If you want to shoot an AK, um, Putin's hiring. Putin is Putin's hiring. So is Zelensky for that matter. If, if you're, if you're, yeah, but Zelensky will pay you an American money. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to go to the re-education camp first. Mm -hmm. yeah. Putin's gonna pay you in like lumps of coal and Svetlana's. Yeah, um, join, join the Russian army. He's, he's, we give you blonde. He's you trying survive, to, you keep blonde. He's, try, <laughs> he's trying to get people to, you know, build build trenches and can't yep. get people to come out and build trenches. So Hey, you know what? If you're a conscript, we're not going to send you abroad. But conveniently, the fight is right here in Kursk. <laughs> we, will not, we will not send you out of Russia to fight if you are conscript. We have decided everything is Russia. Yeah. So you are not out of Russia. We have sure. not lied what to you. The, the Donbass is now Russia. Right. Uh, Kursk. That's not that. That actually, you know, kind of legitimately. Is Russia. Russia. Yeah. yeah. So, it, it, and, and I, had, years ago, I had a, I interviewed a guy who was a witness in a case. And uh, so I went and talked to him. He was, he was some kind of Ivan. So I said, so what part of Russia are you from? I'm not Russian. I'm from Belarus. Said, yeah, you're Russian. I'm not Russian. I'm from Belarus. So really, what language do they speak in Belarus? We speak Russian. I said, yeah, because you're fucking Russian. <laughs> right? So all you people in Vienna speaking German, you're all Germans. So there for a while you legitimately were. So we're speaking <laughs> English? So we're... No, 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 no. no. <laughs> look here, look, look here. Hey. <laughs> First off... <laughs> You go talk to anybody from England and ask them if Americans speak English, and they will unequivocally tell you, no, the shit they speak is as close to English as what they speak in Ireland. <laughs> we don't speak English. We speak... <sighs> now, they say that there's people on Tangier Island who are still speaking English. But there's only two family trees over there. Looks there's, like there's a, I'm not sure if there's anybody really left there for that, but... Yeah. Well, I, Desert Storm, right? When I, when I worked with the, with, with the Her Majesty's, at the time, Her Majesty, not yeah. His Majesty, Her Majesty's, you know, you know, Royal Military Police. And they liked us because, as they said, you speak English. So, all, all, the rest, all the rest of these people, all these rest of these Europeans, I don't know. I don't know. I'll speak some, I, some form of Russian I, or I, German. That's right, there. Yeah. They're all they're all speaking. Yeah, yeah. Look at all these ungrateful we, we like colonists. Her, we, like, we, like working for, we like working with you. I had somebody ask me one time if I spoke French, and I said only Vichy French. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not speaking that language. It's not conquered people. <laughs> all right. Well, since we're, oh, and if anybody was offended by what we said, and you happen to be in England, um, we sorry. have a thing called uh, the Constitution here and habeas corpus, and private gun ownership. So good luck extraditing me to stand trial for hurting your fucking feelings. That's the next podcast. That pack of bullshit happening over there. All right, rocks, bottles, bombs, hand grenades. We've had enough of them. Keep your powder dry.
right. I guess that's it. Bye.